I have to admit that I'm a person who suffers from zone envy, uh, causing me to try many plants just to see if I can grow them here successfully. Okay, the first plant I want to talk about is the lotus. And a, many may not realize, but Minnesota does have, well, a, a native lotus. Native, if by that definition you mean a plant that was growing in Minnesota prior to European settlement. However, this lotus, it's the yellow lotus, Nelumbo lutea, was brought here by the Native Americans. It was not native to Minnesota. They brought it up as they moved along the Mississippi River, and it's only found in locations where Native Americans had established villages. There are many kinds of lotus. You can get them small teacup size or a medium size, as you see on the left, Chowan Basu, or large, like the yellow native, uh, Lutea. You can grow these in containers. As you see, I have a 16-inch container. A round container is better because the uh, lotus tubers will continuously form a ring around the exterior, or you can grow them in a pond, as I have here. If you have a pond, either natural or man-made, that is over 45 inches, and you leave water in it over the winter, all you have to do is drop your lotus pot to the bottom of the pond. Usually it won't freeze down that far to 45 inches, and you just overwinter them that way. We drain our pond, however, for the winter because it's only 28 inches. And then I take them in the garage over the winter. They go dormant and uh, will not start growing again until uh, usually about uh, April. Uh, lotus have to be divided every two or three years. And at first, I thought that you had to uh, take them out, wash off the water, and then cut them apart. Well, that's a lot of work. After a few years, I realized they're all just growing either along the bottom or circling around the side. So all you really have to do is clip them apart. You don't have to wash off all the water. And here's what they look like when you clip them apart. What you want is kind of a fat banana looking tuber. And you just clip it off and each of these are growing tips. Those growing tips you have to be very careful not to hurt uh, because that's where the leaf and the next flowers will come out of. If you break that off when you're dividing them then that tuber is done. Last year's tubers turned brown like this, and you just throw those away. Then all my surplus tubers I put in a pot of water like this, and I can hold them there in the garage, which is about 50 degrees, hold them in the dark for about a month or so, and then I can plant them. And to plant them, you fill the pot about a third of the way with soil, and you mix in a fertilizer granules. Then you fill it with regular soil that doesn't have any granules, and then you place your lotus on the top, and you weight it down with a rock, and away you go. Now you see I have two growing tips here. I always put in an air and a spare. You never know uh, whether one is actually going to go. A lotus flower is open only for three to five days, depending on how windy it is, and maybe you'll get a half a dozen flowers per pot. So I have a variety of lotus, some bloom earlier than others, so that I can be sure to have one going all season long. I once had a photographer from uh, Chicago call and say he would pay me any amount of money if I could supply him with a lotus for a photo shoot, but I said, I'm sorry, I don't have any blooming today. I'd be happy to help, but I just can't. So you, you really can't uh, tell when you're going to have them, but when you do, they are gorgeous. And you want to be careful not to slice a tuber, a big tuber like this in two. You see that uh, it has all these holes that admits water and it will flood the rest of the tuber, causing it to die. Now, Native Americans and uh, Asians 
eat these. They uh, cut slices out of them and fry them. And you could also roast the seeds and eat those. Lotus seeds have been known to be viable for up to 1,000 years. They have dug them out of tombs uh, in uh, Asia, germinated them, and I've seen stands of lotus from those seeds that were 1,000 years old. Two ways to fertilize them. You can either, like I said, get the pellets and put it in a third of the soil at the bottom of your pot, um, and then you're done for the season. Or uh, you can buy these tabs and push them in, uh, maybe five in each pot by each uh, major uh, leaf that's coming up, and then do that each month. Now, because I have fish in my pond, I really don't have to fertilize as much. Maybe I'll just uh, fertilize with the tablets uh, in the beginning and then once halfway through. The fish produce plenty of fertilizer, so I don't really need these. All right, on to my next favorite type of plant, aeroids. And some of you have seen me bring these in bloom to the plant sale. The ones that you're looking at on the left are Amorphophallus cognac. And it is a very stately plant. Mine get to be uh, four to five feet tall at maturity. The leaf will be as tall as the flower and, and vice versa. They're a marvelous vertical accent in a shade garden. And the native equivalent of this is the jack in the pulpit, which is much more diminutive. The Amorphophallus cognac and these kinds of aeroids are, are very interesting. In order to get them to set seed, you'll see there are two kinds of flowers here. At the base, the white ones are the male flowers, and the darker ones underneath it are the female flowers. They do not open at the same time. Thus, the plant is self-infertile. So if you want flowers, you have to have two of them blooming slightly out of register. And this has only happened for me once in the 20 years or more that I've been growing them. And here you see the flower stalk uh, that was created. And as I said, this is a marvelous vertical accent in a shade garden, for example, of hostas. And there is my wonderful seed head. I was so proud that I brought it to the Minnesota State Fair. The judges didn't know what to make of it, and it didn't get anything. But anyway, I educated the public on what this might look like. And next to it is the seed pod of the Jack in the Pulpit. And by the way, I planted the seeds of my Amorphophallus cognac, and every single one of them germinated. So I've got a lot of them. Okay, what does the corm look like? The corm grows uh, very fast uh, each year, and sometimes a person might not appreciate how much it grew since you planted it, and you might dig it up, slicing off a piece of it, not realizing how big it actually got. You put a little manure in with these, and they can grow fairly rapidly. They do have to be taken in over the winter. I have heard of some people overwintering them up next to the house with a lot of mulch on it, but it's not too likely this would work every time. I put mine in either a paper bag or a cardboard box. You can also just have them sitting out on the shelf like you see here. I do this in my garage because it is a heated garage and uh, it's heated to about 50 degrees. These also multiply by sending out a runner and at the end of the runner is a baby bulb and you can pull this off and then the runner part of it will disintegrate and you're left with the baby bulb. These five, all on the left side of the center picture, all were from the same bulb. Occasionally they won't bloom. Oftentimes it's because they, the bulb is differentiating into multiple bulbs. And you see how flat it is here and here and on the back sides. That's because that was one big bulb. And then when I take it up, then you can divide it. Moving on to the next, I should mention that the 
amorphophallus cognac smells like, well, rotting flesh. And sometimes people don't realize that these type of aeroids can bloom without soil, without water, and without sunlight. And you see this next one, Saramatum venosum, also called uh, Guttatum, is in a pot without soil. And I just put it in the middle of my dining room table and they just come up and bloom. And people don't realize this and they'll have them in a box or a sack or something in the basement and all of a sudden they'll smell something bad and they'll realize that their aeroid is blooming. Uh, if it does bloom in a sack, uh, which I've had that happen to me, it'll be white and the, the flower, of course, won't be attractive. But no problem, the flower will fall off like they normally do and the leaf will come up and be just normal. This particular aeroid smells like a wet diaper. And this is what the leaf looks like. The leaf of this and the last one will have a beautifully mottled stem and a mauve and kind of tan mottled stem. And it's a great accent in a pasta shade garden. Next, we've got Typhonium giganteum also called Ceramatum giganteum. Now with a name like giganteum, you'd think this was going to be a big plant, but no, it's only six to 10 inches tall. And this one smells like sewage. And the first time that it uh, bloomed, I smelt this smell <laughs> out by the deck and I had to search around to find out uh, what was happening and sure enough it was this plant. Next we have the giant of all aeroids, Amorphophallus titanum and this one is also called the corpse flower. This corm will weigh up to 100 pounds and the leaf will be 10 feet tall. My husband begged me on his hands and knees Please do not get a seed of this plant. You can get them on the internet, and I had a friend who did do that, and it was about within a foot of his ceiling. It wasn't mature yet. Um, and fortunately, then he moved to Peru, and hopefully he took his corm with him. It would be a good climate for it there, and he could grow it outside. Now, another favorite aeroid of mine is the giant taro, Alocasia mycorrhizos. And this one I got from a friend in California in about 1980. And I grew it as a house plant for 20 years in about a 12 inch pot. And I had no idea it could be a large plant because it will grow to the size of the pot. Well, then when I married Dan and had more gardening space, I thought, okay, I'll see what happens if I put this outside. Wow. In the ground, with plenty of manure and water, it'll get six feet tall. Each leaf can be four feet long by three feet wide. We use them as accents in our garden. Here, Dan has them on either side of the gazebo. In the fall, we dig them up in September, well in advance of the first frost. And fortunately, EGC has a good collection of pots of every size imaginable behind the greenhouse. And uh, Tim has these large 16-inch diameter pots from his trees and shrubs, which I then get. And the taros that you see there need to be divided. And you just take out your saw us all and divide them up. They work kind of like a Diffenbachia where you can cut off any piece of them and root that or put it in the soil without roots and uh, it'll just take off. But you do have to, when you make a cut, suberize it, that is let the cut dry out before you plant it so that it doesn't rot. The uh, giant taro has a wonderful fragrant scent to it. Unlike the other ones that I just showed you, this one is terrifically beautiful and it throws the scent for quite a distance. The first time I had one bloom, we were looking all over the garden to figure out where this scent was coming from. The flower opens up as a greenish color and they're kind of hidden. So it took us a while to figure out where it was and then they turn yellow when they're mature. 
when you cut a leaf off of the giant taro, you've got to be careful not to cut the most recent leaf. You could take the leaf itself, but don't cut into the stem because the next developing leaf is coming out within the most recent stem. And this one is going to mean that you're only going to get half of that leaf because part of it has been truncated by this unfortunate cut. So here's what it looks like in the fall. We've dug up all the taros and we go to Menards and get these wonderful dollies. And the reason we do that is we keep them in the garage over the winter and we sometimes have to move them around. And then come spring, as in March or April, as soon as we start get evenings over 40 degrees for several running days, then I push them outside. Now, you can see that after a winter in the garage, they aren't too happy. You might only have one or two leaves left, but once they get some nice warm weather and sun, they really take off. And I push them in and out like this so that they can get exercise. Those leaves have to blow in the wind in order to get strong. And of course, they need a lot of light. And I only need uh, six or seven of these for our garden. And then the rest of them go to the plant sale, assuming I've got at least one leaf on them. I found that I have a hard time selling a plant with no leaves on it. I tell them, look, I promise you, this will grow. This will be big. This, this plant is alive. But uh, customers generally want to see a leaf. All right, our next plant is also an aeroid, and this is a calla lily, and these are zone 7. And I particularly like plants that are zone 5 through 7 because these can all be planted in April as soon as the ground has thawed and you can work the soil. I put these in along the gladiolas, which are a similar situation. Uh, because in May, I'm so desperately busy trying to get those things that are too tender that have to wait until after Mother's Day. But those things that I can offload into April, like these calla lilies, we plant them up. And it doesn't matter if there's a frost because the soil is too cold. They aren't going to grow, but they aren't going to die either unless the, the ground actually freezes, which generally is not going to be the case. So the callas are some of the first things that I plant. And the first one that you're looking at, Album Maculata, is about 36 inches tall. And then you've got in the middle the giant calla, Ethiopica, which can be seven feet tall, but not in Minnesota. Maybe I get them to be four feet tall. Now, the problem with this one is that it blooms in the winter. Great. I really need a plant blooming in the winter in my garage. But that's when they bloom. Uh, but they have a beautiful mottled leaf. And when I push them out along with the taros, and, and I put them on a, a dolly, um, then they bloom in my driveway in April. And it looks kind of cool. But I'd rather have them blooming in the summer. <laughs> And then finally, we have the yellow calla, and they are gorgeous too. I dig callas up in early September. You don't have to dig them until just before the ground freezes. However, by early September, the leaves are looking kind of frayed. They don't look too good. And I have so much to do later on in September and October that I want to get these out early. And so you cut off the leaves, but leave the stems like you see here. And I put them up, elevate them so that there is air coming underneath and around, a good circulation so that they will dry out. And then you can just twist off these tops. Don't take them if they're going to be hard to twist, but if they come off easily, then they're ready. If you force them, you might damage this growing tip, which is going to be your leaves for next year. And the calla will be about the size of a dinner plate. And you could cut off each one of these and make separate ones. But I like to leave them in a large clump because each one of these is going to have a flower. And if you just put in one, you'll get the one flower, maybe two. 
and uh, that's all you'll have in that area. And then I overwinter these in a cardboard box. Do not put them in plastic or they will rot. So a cardboard box or a paper bag, uh, but no plastic. And I just overwinter them in our heated garage, or you could put them in your basement in a cool, dark spot. The next flower is the Peruvian daffodil. Well, I don't think it's Peruvian and it's not a daffodil, but when I show you the bulb, you could see that it looks kind of like a daffodil and that's probably why it got the name. Um, it's a zone eight and it's actually related to an amaryllis. It's wonderfully fragrant. And so it's good to put these in pots on your deck or by the walkway. They really will fragrance a large area. And this is what the bulbs look like. The leaves look like an amaryllis leaves, and you just leave those on and let them dry in the garage for two or three weeks. And then after they're looking quite dried like this, then I cut them down shorter, and I put them in a paper uh, cardboard box. And these are peach boxes. They've got holes in them at the beginning of February. And I usually have about 20 of these and I have 10 for our yard and 10 or so for the plant sale. Next we have gladiolus, a zone 7. I like these also because I can plant these bulbs in April as soon as I can work the ground. And it's a wonderful flower for Minnesota's largest insect, which is a bumblebee that is creatively called the black and gold bumblebee. They require a large flower. Most flowers are too small for them to get into. So I usually have a good crop of these bumblebees. Gladiolus should be planted, I would say, starting in April, about every two weeks. That way, they don't all bloom at the same time, and you can have bloom all summer. I also make sure I'm planting a variety of size of these corms, uh, because if you get them all the same size, say all large ones, they will all bloom at the same time. But if you get smaller ones, it takes them all summer to mature, and I have these blooming into October. You don't have to dig these out until just before the soil freezes. And you don't want to dig them any sooner than maybe a month if possible after they're done blooming uh, so that they can charge up for the next year. A corm is defined as anything that regenerates each year. And at the bottom is the old bulb, which is now shrunk to nothing, that I just pull off. And then you let them dry out in the garage for a couple of weeks, and then you just twist off this stem. And then here you see some cormals also developing, and uh, if you want, you can sow these. Some people have planted these up close to the house and mulched them well and gotten them to overwinter. My sister did that, but as soon as you get a wet winter, or if they somehow get too much moisture on it, they will rot. And this is also true of calla lilies. One of Kellendale's members, Joanne Bowie, had them growing for 12 years up against the side of her house before it finally got the conditions too wet and they died. So you can take a chance on these, or better yet, dig them up, or you can treat them as an annual. Then I store them in these bags like you get potatoes in and put them also in a cardboard box, not in plastic. The only thing that you're going to store in plastic is potentially dahlias, and we'll talk about how those are stored. Now here you see three different kinds of dahlias. The first one is a mignon, and these are daisy-like plants. Mignon dahlias have a single flower, and it looks like a daisy, is about that size, except that they bloom their little hearts out continuously all summer. Daisies, uh, most of them you get one flush and then they're done, but the dahlias will just keep right on trucking. Then uh, you have these giant, uh, you call them dinner plate dahlias. This is Calvin Floodlight Colossal, and he truly is colossal. 
I've had them grow uh, eight feet tall. Uh, you've got to be careful to stake those big ones. And then you have the smaller ball dahlias. Uh, this one is called Robin Hood. Now, these get dug uh, in the fall after the first frost. It's best to wait about two weeks after the first frost if you can, because then they'll set their eyes and it's easier to see where to divide them. And you want to save the bulbs that are nice and plump. These that are weazened, you see they're all wrinkled. This is probably not going to be a good bulb. And if the neck is uh, weazened, that's not going to go. So all of these over here, I'm going to discard, and I keep this set over here. There are different ways of storing these, and I've tried a lot of different things. The first one is the labor-intensive one on the left, where you divide them in the fall and then wrap them individually. And they need to be wrapped individually or stored such that they aren't touching one another because if one starts rotting, the whole batch will rot. So you can do this or put them in baggies. Or I also save the bags from the newspapers and the ones that are uh, translucent, like the yellow ones or the um, blue ones, I use uh, to put them in. And you want to be able to see inside so you can tell if you've got some rot going and get rid of them. Well, then after I was doing all this work, I ran into somebody who said, well, they just dig them up, shake off the dirt, and put them in a pot in their heated garage. And then I got a fall where I was so busy, I could not divide them and put them in separate bags. So I thought, okay, I'll try it. And guess what? It works just fine. Um, the vendors will usually tell you to wash them off. No, you don't have to wash them off. And if you do, you've got to be real careful to dry them so that you don't promote any rot. Here, I just threw them in a pot, uh, keeping the labels, and I had about an 80% uh, success rate. And I have an 80% success rate if I put them all in individual bags. Uh, the only advantage with uh, cutting them up in the fall is that I'm busier in the spring than I am in the fall. So if I do have the time to divide them in the fall, I will generally try to do that. When you divide them, you want those cuts to suberize, that is to dry off. And so you have to leave them sit out for a day or two before you bag them, if you're going to bag them. All right, another favorite of mine are cannas, and once again, it's because I can plant them in April. As soon as that ground is thawed enough, you can put them in. They won't die unless the ground freezes. They also don't grow until the ground gets up to about 60 degrees, but at least I've got that off my plate. And they have many beautiful leaves. Uh, here's Pretoria. Uh, and then there is the common bronze leaf. Now, when you dig these up, the common bronze leaf, unknown uh, to me, you just put in a small growing tip like this. And by the end of the season, you get a bushel basket full. We stopped growing this variety because it was just too productive. And people ask, how do you divide something like that? Oh, easy. Dan takes one side, I take the other side. We lift it to our waist and we drop it. And it starts breaking up. And we keep dropping it until I get it down to whatever size I want. Then to store these, I put them up on these racks where you've got good air circulation. Let them dry out for a bit. And then I store them in egg crates in the heated garage. You could put them in a box or a brown paper bag, but I've not had good experience with that. It tends to promote rot. They actually do need a lot of air movement to keep them from rotting. And the only kind that I recommend something different with are like uh, Canna striata, which is more of an aquatic one, and that can dry out too much. So I put them in peat moss in a plastic bag uh, for the true aquatics.
Okay, now we're going to start having some fun in the house. I start potting up things for my own garden in the plant sale beginning in February, and I have about 150 plants going in the house. Now that's in addition to the, I just counted the other day, 96 house plants that I've got. So it gets kind of crowded around here in the spring. Uh, we do have two surplus showers that do have some light, and so I fill the showers with plants and every windowsill and anything that can possibly be used. We have a grow light here in the basement and then when they start getting larger I line them up in the garage because they're getting ready to go outside. Here they've gotten larger. I also have a lot of perennials in the garage, uh, uh, hostas and so forth. Um, and uh, once things start going, here they're lined up and they're ready to be shoved outside. I use a push broom and I push each each flat outside and uh, that's when I get a run of nights over 40 degrees and they sit outside uh, until we get a frost and then I push them all back in. Uh, and you can see over here we got a lot of things started as well. I have a grow light uh, in this area. Okay, when the plants get pushed outside, sometimes it's 40 degrees, but we still have a lot of snow on the ground. You see there on the left, uh, the plants don't care. They're happy to get outside. And in order to make them saleable for the plant sale, um, they, they have to wave in the breeze so that the stems get strong. They have to get lots of light, so they're happy to be out. I also uh, put them up on the deck. And if it gets cold, I have to bring them back into the house, as you can see here. The oriental rugs and the hardwood floors don't much care to have uh, dahlias as neighbors. But come on, it's just going to be for a couple of days. And then I can push them out on the deck. Some plants I can't put in the driveway because marauding deer and rabbits will eat them. And so those ones that are edible, I have to put up on the deck. And I can also, if it's only a light frost, just throw a frost sheet over them. I find that sorry, rabbits will eat dahlias uh, in the spring particularly because um, they haven't got anything else. It's not their favorite. Uh, I do spray them uh, when I have them in unfenced areas in the garden. And they don't get bothered too much, though, because like I say, they aren't a favorite. But the dahlias sure are beautiful, and I believe they're worth the effort. All right, now we're going to look at house plants. The Phalaenopsis orchid is by far the best orchid to grow in a northern climate home. Uh, it's the best plant for Minnesota homes because they need short nights, cold nights in order to trigger blooming. And so I leave these outdoors in a protected area under an overhang until it gets to about 40 degrees consistently and then I bring them in. And if I have just a stray night of frost, I can take the whole stand of orchids and put them in the garage. But this is what triggers them, leaving them out in the fall and having long nights. You also have to fertilize them very well in order to get them to bloom. Orchids need to be fertilized every other week at half strength all year long. Their main blooming time is the winter, which makes them really fun to have in Minnesota. And they will bloom anywhere from a month to four months easily running. I've had them bloom single plant 12 months running. You do this if you get multiple stalks. Do not cut off any of your Phalaenopsis orchid stalks because the next flower stalk will come out of the previous stalk. And then they will also, if you fertilize them well, generate new stalks. And so if you get four stalks going, you can have bloom for six months or more. Now the trade-off there is if you let it have four stalks, it does exhaust the plant. And then it will degenerate to a smaller plant and you've got to start over again. So some people will cut those multi-stalks off and just let one stalk go. And then you would get bigger flowers too, presumably. But 
I love having many flowers, so I let all my stalks go. Orchids are not too much bothered by uh, insects, but Phalaenopsis orchid occasionally do get scale insects. So you mix up a little bit of water and soap and take out your uh, Q-tip and just clean them off. They also get something called orchid weevil, and sometimes if you're getting them from a grower that's not uh, real good, you can wind up with a few of those. And then to get rid of that, you would have to use pyrethrin to spray them with that. Do not plant Phalaenopsis orchids or any orchids in sphagnum moss. It holds too much moisture and the roots will rot and the orchid will die. Very often when you buy particularly Phalaenopsis orchids, they will be in sphagnum moss. And when I get one like that, after it's done blooming, I have to pick off all the moss and put it in orchid bark. The reason the growers put them in sphagnum moss is that it's cheaper. It's They're lighter weight then and cheaper to, to ship, and they have to water them less. I also don't recommend using the ice cube technique of watering these. They say all you have to do to water them is put one or two ice cubes on them a week. Well, the reason the growers recommend ice cubes is that people tend to overwater them because they water it once a week, and then the sphagnum moss will rot them. Well, you haven't got any fertilizer in ice cubes, and these are tropical plants. They like room temperature water, so I don't recommend using that. And then the last plant that I want to say a few words about is Stapelia gigantea, another house plant. They have these marvelous flowers that are as large as your open hand. And I wasn't getting any flowers for quite a few years, and I couldn't figure out why. And then one year, I didn't bother and trim them back. Usually, I'll cut off these bottom lobes and leaves and give them away. Well, the only ones that flower, for I don't know why, are the ones at the bottom. Here you can see a bud, and I've got a flower way down here at the bottom. So uh, if you want these to flower, you really do have to treat them as a hanging plant, and I'll have a few of these at the plant sale as well. If you want to learn more about aeroids, if you have an interest in buying any unusual plants, the place to go is Plant Delights Nursery. Any odd plant they've got. So just uh, go online and find the Plant Delights Nursery Catalog, and you can order to your heart's content. And if you have particular interest in aeroids, the book I recommend is this book by Denny Brown, which has so many of them. Happy planting, a gardener's work is never done.